my side as well to all of you uh, for this QBS Talks webinar where we're going to talk about change management. This time not changing the software as you're used to, as you might have done for the last 10, 20, 30 years, as where your business model is based on, but this time it's changing organizations. And I strongly believe that organizational change management is and will be an important key to project success, as the title says. So you might have been uh, familiar with QBS Talks. It's a service that we deliver from QBS Group. Uh, QBS is a SMB distributor or value add distributor uh, working in uh, all over Europe with more than 500 partners, NAV, CRM, Office 365. Uh, we deliver these services on a frequent basic basis. Uh, as you can see, there's a link. So you can find future um, talks and webinars. And some of you might even say, whoa, this is interesting. I would like to be part of the family. Or well, there's a link where you can find out what it is and what it needs to become a partner of this fast growing ecosystem. A few words about myself. So my name is Gus, as Sander pronounced it. But if you have difficulty saying, and you want to say Goose or Goose or something in between, that's fine with me as well. My last name is Krabbenborg. I'm one of the founders of this nice company. And actually, I've been living all my life, working life in business applications uh, over the last three, four, five years with a specific focus on business transformation. You might be familiar with pro Microsoft programs like R2R, Road to Repeatability. Sp later on, I changed the name into Cloud SureStep for Dynamics. And I've been busy training and coaching uh, hundreds of Dynamics partners uh, in many countries to make that move. I think it's interesting that I also work for prospects, for companies that have plans to buy ERP or CRM systems. And I feel myself a lucky guy to be with one leg on your side and one leg on the buyer side. I can tell you that gives a lot of inspiration, ideas, energy to present in webinars like this or in events where you might have seen me on stage. So for this webinar, uh, I think there's four, let's say, agenda points. First and foremost, I'd like to start with a bit of context. So, you know, what are my observations when I look at projects and project success? Then I want to say a few things about customizations versus standardization. The third topic then is maybe you should consider stop changing the software and start changing the customer and the customer's processes. And last but not least, there's a practical example of an organizational change management workshop that you might find interesting or even might find interesting to start re-delivering yourself to your own customers and prospects. So let's start with the context. So I see when I look at the market and I see partners working, I see a big gap and I try to find a picture that sort of illustrates the gap. And how should you look at this picture? Well, on the right hand side, you see prospects and suspects and people that need a new system or a better system or a system at all. And, you know, you could envision that the left side is the promised land, right? There it is integrated, seamlessly integrated, even user friendly, great process oriented software from vendors that are innovative and so on and so forth. And the, really the only simple things that the prospects you do is jump from the right side of the picture to the left side of the picture. That's the only thing they have to do. Well, most of you know that many of your prospects have difficulties in doing that, right? I always say that our biggest competitor is not SAP, Salesforce or Sage, but I strongly believe that your biggest competitor and our biggest competitor is no decision. Meaning that people say, I know I spent 12 to 18 months in market research, in orientation, in paying my external uh, advisor, in visiting workshops and evaluation and all that. It takes a lot of time, money and energy. But then they say, you know what, please come back in two years time because we decided not to decide. And why they do that is, of course, you know, I could spend 10 webinars on that. But it has to do with the things that are the words you can find on the right side of the slide. It has to do with expectation, with risk. I made it bold and bigger. Engagement, time, budget, consumption, project, outcome. But I strongly believe that risk is one of the biggest reasons why people don't take any decisions. So let's dive a bit deeper in this risk and in this gap. 
Well, first and foremost, I see on a regular basis a gap between you as a Microsoft Dynamics partner and the people you talk to, your potential customer, your prospect. And if I listen carefully to partners, then most of them say, you know, they talk about their solution. They say things, you know, this is how Dynamics, our dynamic solution works. And if you have add-ons or IP, right, probably you say this is an industry-based solution delivered many times by companies similar like yours. We included best practices, and let's not forget, it's even certified for Microsoft Dynamics. So it's CFMD certified, right? How nice is that? But that's sort of sending inside out, because if you look at what prospects say, your customer or future customers, you know, first and foremost, they will all say they're unique, right? That's why I decided to make it bold. We are unique. We're not standard. How often do you hear that? And then they probably will say, this is how we used to work for the last 10 or 8 or 15 years, depending on how long they work with the previous system, right? And, you know, they might even say, prove us the flexibility of Microsoft Dynamics or Dynamics 365, because every partner is claiming that flexibility is a strong point. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I do believe and I, I, I insist on the fact that flexibility is a strong point. However, I also believe that flexibility at the same time is the weakest point of your dynamic solution. So here's a gap between the partner and the prospect. But if you look into the prospect organization a bit deeper and you, you consider that there is a strategic level where the business owners or the senior management is living and there's an operational level where people do the work, the process, make the bills, deliver the service and whatever, I see another gap. And that's the gap between operations and strategy. So if you look at the operational level at the customer side, you know, these people are focused and interested in solving short-term issues. Let's be honest, most of them don't have any insights in business strategy. And the bigger companies are, the bigger the distance between operations and strategy. These people by themselves are not really motivated to change, right? I would say in a broader perspective, human beings are not really very good at change. I'll spend some words on that later. And that means that operational levels at your customer side will create a demand for modifications that never stops. Now, I know many of you would say, Gus, slow down, be careful, right? Don't, don't be upset because it's great that they ask for modifications because that's our business model. Because we deliver services and, you know, customizations. And it's great that there's a never ending demand because it means a never ending revenue. However, if you look at the strategic level at your customer side, first and foremost, I know you know this, they hate budget overruns, right? They don't pay the bills anymore. They start talking with you, maybe with a lawyer, maybe did it, uh, a lawsuit, right? They know that time to value in today's world is getting more and more important. If they have two propos proposals on the table, one could deliver in 12 months, the same, another could deliver in six months, you know, they prefer the six months option. Even stronger, they're willing and prepared to pay more for the partner that can deliver fast because they know how important time to value is. One, that's one of the learnings they got like from previous implementations. And then let's not forget what's happening. These people don't just focus on dynamics. They also look at non-dynamics competitors and they see new born in the cloud partners that can deliver fast, much faster than you do. Last but not least, on the operational level, people do their job and it's five o'clock to go home. From the strategic level, you might expect that they know what's happening in the market and they understand what disruption means. They understand what disruption risks are and they know the more customizations, the longer it takes, probably the bigger the risk to be disrupted. So implementation, in my opinion, equals change. The question is, what are you changing? Are you changing the customer towards the software or the software towards the customer like you always did? Okay, then let's take a look and have on customizations versus standardization. Let me start, start with a small tail. I know that Sander put some pressure on my, uh, on my timing, but let, let me do a small tail. I met a Dynamics customer on an event. And I asked him, so how long are you a Dynamics customer? And he said, well, to be honest, I'm a customer for six years, um, but I changed partners a year ago. Well, if you have my profession, 
you know, that's a point where I always start uh, listening more carefully. So I say, hey, why did you change partners? And they said, well, actually, six years ago, we wanted to select a new system with new software. And at the end, we had two offerings on the table. Both were Microsoft Dynamics, but there were two specific partner approaches. One partner offered verticals add-ons, and they say they include best practices, and it's running with many customers like yours. So we're willing and able, you know, to tackle the challenges you have. But, you know, in order to get most out of this investment, you should be open to change, change your processes and your mindset. Where the other partner says, you know, the good point of dynamics is flexibility. So we can make everything you want and we wrap, you know, the system as a blanket behind along your organization, right? So they offered pure customizations and the, the customer said, well, it was not easy, but in the end we selected the customization offer. And why? I asked why. He said, well, we could stay in our comfort zone. We didn't change, didn't need to change the processes, right? So all good. But then I said, how was the implementation? He said, whoa, that was the bad part of the story because the implementation was very, very, very complex. Took much, much, much more time than expected and it cost them much more. So it was money, time, energy, frustration. Finally, they got live, right? And then they started realizing that they re-automated their legacy processes, that they re-automated the way they implement the previous system, right? And they started realizing that their competitors were, were modernizing where they stayed behind. And he really said, Gus, it was that we were financially okay. Otherwise, we could have killed ourselves by doing this. So after five years, there was this point of evaluation where they said, do we have the right vendor and system? The answer was yes. Second question, are we with the right partner? The answer was no. And then they decided to go for the partner, switch partner, and to take the partner that ended up number two in the beginning. Interesting story. Right, food for thought. So, let me see. So, if I think, sorry, if I think about old processes, I use this big this picture a lot of times. I'm not sure about your age. I can't, although we're Dutch, I can't be too blunt to ask for your age. But I hope most of you will recognize the piece of equipment on the left side of the page. And I deliberately put the name on it. It's a fax, right? Piece of paper that we communicate to, to share information. Many of you will know or will not know that the equipment on the right side of the page, Sander, I'm curious if you know, it's called a Taylor fax, and it was used before the fax was re really even invented. And I know this sounds like grandfather tells his last story, but I use these two, metaf these two metaphors as indications for legacy. So what I see is that many companies want to switch to a new system, but they take their fax processes with them or even the tailor fax. And then, you know, I can't stop but saying to them, so please tell me how many tailor faxes do you expect to receive in the next 10 years? In other words, you know, isn't it a bit foolish to take your old processes with you without modernizing and updating? So that brings me to this slide that you might have seen before, one of my favorites. It says you can't do today's job with yesterday's methods, yesterday's processes, yesterday's equipment, and expect to be in business tomorrow. Great slide, great to put in your PowerPoint, great to put in your pitch, and a great slide to discuss with any executive from any customer or prospect in the world. Well, what's the impact on your customer base? If you're still in this customization mode, you'll see that a growing part of your installed base is on old versions. I've been told that Dynamics NAV, 160,000 customers worldwide, right? More than 70%, that's 70, is running NAV 2009 or older. Well, let's face it, 2009 is already nine, year, nine years old, and the rest is even older, right? It means that if you lock your customers in in customizations, they can't move, they can't upgrade. Sooner or later, they open the door and might run away. Put your customer base under risk. Secondly, those people get unhappy because they get limited or no value for their maintenance contracts. Why? Well, the person that created the customization, if they're lucky, is on holiday and will return in a few weeks. But more likely, the person left the company is now working for another partner. So the most critical part of their system that should support their primary processes, that should act as a pacemaker when their heart stops bumping, has no support at all. Right? 
And then there's no benefits from the ongoing Microsoft innovation. Of course, they see and read from new NAV versions. They see from innovation. They, they read about Dynamics 365 Business Central. Some customers even have more time to read than you yourself. They might even know more, but they can't touch it, right? Because you locked them in. And then if they open the door and invite everybody, then the grass at the neighbors might be greener, right? So in other words, if you make money on putting so many customizations on your customer, you put your customer at risk over time. And why is that especially important today? Well, we see first and foremost that subscription pricing is the standard, right? If you're still able to sell on premise with upgrade upfront payments, good for you, but you better get used to the fact that people will sign a subscription pricing, which is a temporary contract. Six months, 12 months, 24, I don't care. But if they're not happy, they will move to another partner. So that's called we call churn, loss of contracts, right? You did, we didn't have that in on-premise so much. Second point is we see the frequency of new versions coming up. NAV, as you know, had a new version every two years. Then it went every year. And now Marco Perisic announced that with Business Central, starting this fall, we'll have a rhythm of every six months. Six months, meaning that if you put them uh, again full with customizations in a five-year user period with a two years upgrade, they might be two versions behind after five years. Welcome in a new world. When it's every six months, they might be 10, 11, 12 versions behind. Right? Food for thought. And then for you as a partner, it's getting more complex, which means higher risks. You get more discussions over about total cost of ownership. Right? There's less control over your customers. Right? and your revenue streams are under risk. So I put in this slide once again that shows customizations for a standard, right? And on the left-hand side, you see, let's say, the characteristics from customizations. On the right-hand side, you see the characteristics from standards. In the bottom, I made it bold and a bit, a, a, a bit bigger. I think that's the most important one. If you customize, you re-customize or re-automate yesterday's processes, where if you think about standard with a good add-on and proactive project product management, people will find best practices, new practices, future-oriented. And isn't that what in investments in IT are all about? So I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that you should stop changing the software as massive as you do it today and start thinking about changing the customer, right? And then... The change in dynamics is change the software to your specialization, make an add-on that fits with your target group, your macro or micro vertical, and then second step, change the customer and his or her processes towards your specific vertical solution. Well, question is that easy because you hear me talking about change. Well, I can say, and I think you will know, that change is far from easy. A human nature is averse of change, right? That's not how we build. That's not how we are constructed. So mo change needs motivation, right? Needs an urgent reason, needs a vision, right? And even with a vision and an urgent reason, we all know example where change came too late. Super important if you want to change mindset and change processes is exemplary behavior. And that's not the behavior of the IT manager, but of course, that's the behavior of the top management of your customer's organization. So if you think about the importance of change management, talking organizational change, right? I found some interesting data. One from Panorama Consulting that found out that the biggest problems in CRM projects are lack of buy-in. Why should we do this, right? I'm not interested. I'm not involved. Lack of resources, lack of budget, right? But the biggest by far, twice the number two, is lack of buy-in, right? I'm not involved. And then from Prossi that found out in a survey, companies that adopt change management strategies are six times more likely to achieve the results and business benefits. Six times, lady, ladies and gentlemen, that's not, not less, right? So that brings me by step four. Sandra, I hope still on schedule. Step four of this presentation that talks about the idea to organize an organizational change management workshop, right? So this is a workshop that you typically could deliver Either if you're on the shortlist, so you're in a new business case, right? There's two or three vendors on the shortlist left. You're one of them. You might say to your prospect, okay, so we're getting closer to the final decision, right? Always good. But can I ask you, Mr. or Mrs. Business Owner, CEO, Geschäftsführer or whatever, 
how do you cope with the change? Because if you choose for us or the other system, be it Sage, Salesforce, CRM, uh, uh, SAP, I don't care, with every, whichever you choose of the two, the processes are different, the user interface is different, the buttons are in different places. So how are you going to cope with that? And then, you know, the answer probably will be, wait, that's a good question. Well, we've been thinking about it. We don't know the answer. Why you ask? And then there's partners that say, well, we could facilitate this process for you by delivering a workshop. Of course, it's a valuable workshop. So there's value. It means I have to pay for that. Their good news is it's not about dynamics. It's not about SAP or Salesforce. It's product agnostic, right? It's solution independent. The most important thing next to making money on delivering the workshop is that you steal, you win their hearts, you win their emotions, right? You show your involvement, not so much in selling, you know, delivering the license, send an invoice and run away, but you show your involvement in project success, right? And of course, that differentiates you from competitors. Another way of doing it is win the deal first and then say, okay, the first step of the implementation is not installing the software and start as you'd start today, but start with the workshop again as a paid activity and, and focusing on the management or the middle management. And yes, of course, parts of that content is great also to use in kickoff meetings, where it's not so much about management, but also the end users. Ideal target audience, well, depends, of course, on the size of the company, but it would be great to have the board of directors and the business owners and maybe even the middle management in those workshops. So what I did, I selected a few slides from a slide deck that covers a one day workshop. So just a few to give you some idea. And it talks about failure in projects. It might sound strange to start talk about failure, but I can tell you one thing. The fear for failure is the biggest reason why people not don't take a decision. So why not start talking about failure? Not failure with your solution, but failure in general. And then there's this paradox uh, 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 written by Mr. Cobbs in the last century who says, we know why project fails, right? Why they fail. That's not ERP, CRM, but that's, you know, infrastructure, highway, airports in Berlin and what have you, right? We know how to prevent their failure. So why do they still fail, right? I, I can tell you from my own experience, this is a great slide to start a discussion with senior management people who are not interested in bits and bytes, but very interested in success, right? There's exercises in this workshop. Here's one of them as a sort of a warming up where you split up your audience in small groups and you let them analyze their current ERP or CRM or both situation and ask them to be critical. What went well in the implementation eight years ago? What went wrong? And please don't finger point to the vendor or the system, but do not forget your own to, to evaluate your own contribution. Did you bring in the right key users? Did they take to have the time for training? Did we have enough time for the end users to get trained? Right? Um, were it the best? Was it supported by the management? Right? And then, especially, what are the lessons learned? Because of course, companies should prevent to go from a half successful implementation to another half successful implementation. They should learn from that, right? And then, you know, simple questions as what is ERP or CRM? You can use the content for both, right? And nice if you have those people in the room and first ask them to write down in one or two minutes on a piece of paper what they believe ERP is. And then you get answers like this, right? It's a CD, which is correct. Or it's a project or a service, right? It's one version of the truth. It's an attitude, right? I can tell you great discussions, 20, 15, 20 minutes discussion just around this one slide to get people on the same page of the book. What is it? What is it not? Next question could be, what's the benefits? Well, some people expect more sales. I implement CRM, but do you really believe that the day after you install it, you get 30% more revenue? Is that realistic? Or is it the other way around that you get 30% less maybe because everybody's involved in the implementation? And then, you know, what kind of benefits can we expect? Who benefits from the benefits? Is it Michael, the CEO, if that happens to be the name of the CEO? Is it the direct manager? Is it your colleagues? Maybe it might be other departments, right? If you start moving to an integrated solution, there's a big chance that processes change in a way that an employee from department A now should work on department C, another, another place to work. Uh, other colleagues, other chef, other boss, maybe other salary, 
that brings uncertainty. What does it mean for my future, for my career? And really, dear Mr. Customer, do you believe that the IT department can arrange this? Of course not. That's an organizational point, right? And then the question is, what determines success? Is it the software? Is it the partner? Or maybe it's a prospect organization. Some people might say it's coincidence. And which skills do you need to get success? Is it really only IT knowledge? Or is it honesty, passion, motivation? People that can think out of the box okay, and get motivation, motivated to do that. And the question then, who determines success? Is that the board? Is it the IT manager who's gonna be killed if the project fails? Or is it all together? Right? And then another exercise around failure and no decision. Remember, we're in the shortlist phase. They should understand what the impact of no decision is. Like returning to your old system that wasn't supported and invested in for the last year in a burning platform that's not supported anymore. Or even worse, what's the impact of failure? Right? CV damage, loss of money, frustration, no more support internally. And again, people were asked then to present that. So this is slides from a one-day workshop, workshop that could be delivered by QBS to you, a workshop that we could, where we could train your people, train the trainers, so that you're able to do it yourself, right? There are several options here. And then there's preparedness to change, because in the end, if you want to use standardized, multi-tenancy, cloud software, and you say, better to change my processes, people need to be prepared, right? So how do you do that? How do you educate that? How do you communicate in a kickoff? What's the role of the management? And again, what does that mean for customizations? So this then is the last slide. Again, it's only a handful of slides in a full day workshop. And it says, you know, in the end, it's all about money. And it's up to you, dear Mr. or Mrs. Customer, if your CRM or EAP project ends in an owl situation, like on the left hand side, left hand side, where you end up like a beggar, or with the same solution, the same consultant same implementation methodology results in a wow right so there's a partner case two more minutes to go a partner case that i described where a german nav partner tegos from dortmund they acquired the content of this workshop added this to their internal their own internal sure step microsoft sure step approach which is pretty much technical focus as you know function feature focused not bad but less active in the change side, then we've trained their project managers, the sales and marketing people, assisted them with their first workshop at a prospect. Of course, it's going to be, it became a success. Otherwise, I wouldn't tell you. And now they offer this service in every sales cycle if they're on the shortlist. They're very happy with that. So I asked uh, Ingo Kailuwait, he is one of the executive board members, to come up with a sm small uh, quote. And of course, otherwise I wouldn't have selected him. He said this completely changed the way we address the change topics and the results are amazing. Well, I think on a sunny Monday afternoon, that's good news to hear, right? So I would like to end with a few call to actions. First and foremost, in the new world, cloud first, Dynamic 365 Business Central, I think it's worthwhile to not so much market and sell the product but to sell the concept. And part of the concept is this update frequency every six months. And I think we should have a pitch or improve the pitch to motivate prospects to stay close to the standard because it means they don't get as isolated. They can benefit from innovation, ongoing innovation, and they'll keep their total cost of ownership on an acceptable level. I would say if I were in your shoes, consider expanding your implementation methodology and think about adding change skills which brings point three, build internal change management skills. So who's the person to re-deliver content like this, right? You can make your own or uh, acquire it once the, this stuff that we have and think about methodology. When in the sales cycle are you gonna talk about this? How do you do that, right? And then I would say when it comes to implementation, try to think change first, right? Change processes first rather than customize first, right? and customize only when necessary. And yes, I know that this has an impact on your delivery organization. And yes, I know you should look at your targets from the delivery people and not everybody will be happy with that. But I think in the new, let's face the new world, it's better to have customers for a smaller revenue that are happy with your more standardized solution and where you can open opportunities for change management that most of you don't do today, rather than keep on customizing and have a hard time to find new customers. 
And then last thing to think about is maybe motivate your salespeople in their bonus schemes and compensation, right? To sell the standard plus the change. Well, Sander, I think we started two minutes past four. I'm a bit surprised to see that it's now two minutes past 4.30. So it means that we're pretty much on schedule. And actually, I'm done. And my question is, uh, did you see any questions?